Welcome to the Unseminary Podcast. Are you looking for practical ministry help to drive your ministry further, faster? Have a sinking feeling that your ministry training didn't prepare you for the real world? Hey, you're not alone. Join thousands of others in pursuit of stuff that we wish they had taught in seminary. Buckle up and let's get started with this week's Unseminary Podcast. All right, well, welcome to Unseminary. My name's Rich Birch. I'm the host here uh, at Unseminary. A part, you know, this is my site. So glad that you've decided uh, to be here to tune in. I want to tell you about this month's course. I've really been looking forward to this literally for months. I've been excited uh, to record this, to release it, because I really do think it's going to make a difference in so many of the churches that track with us here at Unseminary. A couple years ago, I bumped into a little book uh, that had a huge influence on uh, on my church and on our leadership. And um, over the last couple years, got to know the author a little bit better. He came and spoke uh, at our church a couple years ago, and that made a huge impact on us. Al Pitampali, he's a great leader. He's an author speaker, uh, really a, a culture warrior when it comes to the whole idea of meetings. And, you know, his TED talk is amazing. TEDx talk is amazing. His book exploded into, um, you know, Amazon was downloaded like a hundred thousand times or something like that in the first week. Um, it was a part of, uh, Seth Godin's project, the domino project. So he has, he's been blessed by St. Seth, uh, you know, which is a great thing. Uh, so Al, I am just excited for you to share with our people, but why don't we, why don't we tell us, why are you so passionate about something that can be so in mundane as meetings? Why are you so passionate about meetings? Well, you know, I started at a company called Ernst & Young, which is a, a consulting firm, and I worked with Fortune 500 companies all over the country. And, you know, when I go to these Fortune 500 organizations to advise them, I just got caught up in all these meetings. And it was a terrible, terrible experience. <laughs> I mean, I, I, you know, it seemed like, it seemed like everyone else just took this as a fact of work life in organizations. Right. Um, but I just couldn't understand why there were these meetings that people were spending all their day in, but nothing was getting done. Oh, gosh. And right. the reason why I'm so passionate about this is because I believe in the value of organizations. You know, when you think about what an organization is, the promise of an organization, it's pretty simple. We don't often think about it, but it's the idea that multiple people working together in concert, mm. you know, systematically can do way more than they could individually, right? Mm. They can achieve these powerful, powerful missions when they're working together. And I got so frustrated to learn that the meeting, which is kind of the linchpin of how people work together in small and big organizations, was it seems like it was preventing them from achieving their missions ins instead of instead of basically accelerating right. their paths towards these missions. So I could care less about the meetings. I care I care about people's missions. Yes, and that's why I think meetings can be a, a tool to accelerate the path to the mission. Is why I'm so passionate about them. Absolutely. So uh, your book is called. It's got a great title. Read this before our next meeting. Uh, fantastic title. How did you come up with that title? That's just a great, why did you call it that? It's a, it's a good question. Um, I wanted something that would uh, kind of provoke people a little bit. And, yep. the, and the, the premise of the book is it's supposed to be like, if you read it closely, apparently it's not as obvious as I, as I originally thought. No, no, um, but uh, it's supposed to be somebody who's fed up with meetings and, and sends a memo out to their staff that read this before our next meeting. We're not doing things the same anymore. I'm tired of this. And here's a plan on how to move forward. Um, so it, it is, it kind of, the title conforms to the thesis, which is that we should meet less, meet only for good reasons, and really communicate via other options um, for all the other stuff. Very cool. Um, now you also, you know, you blog, uh, you have a blog, you're, uh, you know, you're online. Where, if people want to reach you online, where, where can they do that? Yeah, they should go to modernmeetingstandard.com, which is my website. You can sign up for my newsletter where I send out updates and articles to the blog and that kind of thing. Nice. Now, I don't know if this may be, uh, this may be giving too much away, uh, but you've got a new book coming out. Um, are you having the privilege to talk about that or is it too, are we too early? Sure. I mean, I, I can reveal a little bit about it. Yeah. Um, the book is on the topic of persuadability. So okay. there's a million books on how to be more persuasive, mm -hmm. but I argue in our culture, we're actually already pretty persuasive. What we're really bad at is being persuadable in the sense that no one really has a genuine willingness to change their minds anymore. You know, 
and politics and organizations and relationships. So what I want to do is I want to try to create a handbook for how do you change your mind? You know, how do you listen to somebody else and decide that, you know what, that's a good idea. I should listen to that. Um, this is, you know, this dovetails really well with meetings because I feel like we would have a better, we would have better organizations in a better world if people would come to meetings with a persuadable mindset, you know, looking to actually say, you know what, if I hear a better idea than mine in this room, I'm going to change my mind. Because at the end of the day, we, you know, we're all on, uh, on the path towards our missions. And if one idea gets us closer to that mission faster, that's the idea we should adopt. Hmm. Well, you're going to be in for a real treat in this course with Al. Al is, um, he has a way of looking at things that uh, that makes me think, that pushes me in a new direction, that uh, gets me, you know, stirs a bit of emotion, does get me thinking like, gosh, I got to change something about the way I do uh, what I do. But I, I think that's super good. And so um, you're going to love this course. You're going to love, um, you know, it, it's six sessions long. Uh, it's six videos that really each one we've tried to frame in a certain way that they are really digestible. You're probably going to want to listen to them a couple times, kind of chew it up and say, okay, what do I want to do different this coming weeks? Some of the questions we're going to be answering answering is, you know, how uh, do we use the meeting to officially, uh, to efficiently reach a decision? We talk about, you know, what are the difference between above the line decisions and below the line decisions? You know, how do we ensure that meetings don't just become long monologues? I know when we were talking about that, I thought, gosh, I, I think I've participated in a few of those where it's, I think people are just really excited to hear themselves talk. And so how do we, um, you know, make sure that meetings aren't like that? And um, so there's a lot of great content in here. So um, you're going to enjoy the course. Um, we're just, I'm so thankful, Al, that you took some time out uh, to help us, to help us take some steps uh, closer uh, to really meetings that ultimately move the mission forward. That's what we're, you know, really trying to do here uh, at Unseminary. So thank you so much uh, for being a part of uh, Unseminary this month. Yeah, it's an honor for me, Rich. This is the Unseminary Podcast. Stuff you wish they taught in seminary. All right. Well, I clearly am excited to have Al in this month's course, and I really would love you to check it out. If you're a listener to the podcast or maybe you watch us online, check us out at unseminary.com forward slash join. Now, I've got a little extra treat here. Uh, we've actually got Al speaking at an event a couple of years ago. Uh, you're going to get a taste of him, a little bit of sense of some of the stuff that's inside the course or really a taste of kind of who he is uh, as you listen in. So listen to the rest of this to get a sense of who he is. And don't forget to drop by unseminary.com uh, forward slash join to learn more about our premium program. Hope you have a great week. And uh, I won't say anything at the end of this. It'll just be the kind of normal end. But listen all the way through because Al's got some great insights for us as we lead meetings. This is the Unseminary Podcast. Stuff you wish they taught in seminary. How's everyone doing tonight? So years ago, uh, I was involved in this project with these churches to help them fundraise. It was a fun idea. It didn't require any time or money on the part of the church. It was going to raise them a ton of cash. Quite frankly, it was a great deal. So what I'd do is I'd call these churches, and I'd find the person who was responsible for fundraising. I would tell them exactly how the program worked, and I'd even show them case studies of all the other churches that we got great results for. Now, the, time, the, the response I would get time and time again was fascinating to me. They'd say, thank you, Al, this is fantastic. We can't believe you called us. I just have to run this by my committee at our next meeting in six weeks. <laughs> committee meeting? Six weeks? I would say, Nancy, 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 help me out here. Aren't you the VP of fundraising? I'd spend the next 15 minutes trying to convince Nancy that she should make this decision. But alas, it never worked. I could have been Ed McMahon from the publisher's clearinghouse with a check for $1 million, and she wasn't taking it from me until she had her committee meeting. See, in Nancy's mind, she didn't make decisions. No committee meetings made decisions. In big rooms with lots of people and someone there to record the minutes. Of course, I didn't want to wait six weeks, so I just called up other churches and found someone else to raise money for. Ladies and gentlemen, we are not ready for this revolution. The world is fundamentally changing. Hyperconnectivity, hyper-competition, globalization, they're making our world move faster and faster and faster, yet we're still filing into a meeting room every single time we need to make a decision. See, for so long we've lived in this paradigm where meetings made decisions. It worked. We got, we, we got to a dodge responsibility and it was harder to make mistakes, but in our new world, in our new globalized world, meetings don't make decisions anymore. Leaders do. Leaders make decisions, not meetings. A 26-year-old captain 
on the station on a small field base on the border of Afghanistan and Pakistan has full authority to order joint fire, both artillery and air. Full authority, he's only 26 years old, why? Because it, his enemy is decentralized. The Taliban can come at him at any second from any moment and he doesn't have time to wait for his commanders to have a meeting to tell him what to do. He's the one who's closest to the action. He's got the intelligence at his fingertips, so he orders the fire. Meetings don't make decisions, leaders do. Just a couple years ago, during the height of the credit in the real estate bubble, Tom Friedman tells us that the lawyers who were getting fired were the ones who weren't making mistakes. The ones who were just doing the work and just giving it right back. No, they needed the lawyers to innovate. The differentiation was so important because law firms needed to separate themselves from the competition. So in order to innovate though, you need to take a risk. In order to take a risk, you have to make a decision. Because if your boss is making the decisions, well then he's the one who's taking the risk. And therefore it's his innovation. Meetings don't make decisions, leaders do. Just a couple weeks ago, the Ragu, the company who's famous for the tomato sauce, started at messaging random dad bloggers on Twitter. You guys probably know this story. Well, one of those dad bloggers was CC Chapman. Basically, they were spamming them with this link that was supposed to be funny. CC Chapman didn't find it very funny. He wrote a post online titled, Ragu Hates Dads. <laughs> it went, of course it went viral, created a firestorm online. Everybody was online that day criticizing Ragu, waiting to see how long it would take them to respond. You know how long it took Ragu to respond? Three days. Three days to post some pathetic, half-witted, unapology on some blog online. To me, it's funny to speculate how many meetings must have occurred over those three days at Ragu headquarters. How many meetings of a committee of people, most of whom probably don't even use Twitter. So, Here's the interesting thing to me, the fascinating thing. Not one person was willing to step up and make a quick decision. Not one person at Ragu, not even an intern, saw what was happening and just said, you know what, I'm just going to post a comment, apologize. Thank you for tuning in to not this week's Unseminary podcast. Don't be shy. We'd love to connect. Well, Check can. out Unseminary Inbox. You, you can sign up at unseminary.com and we'll send you helpful training resources every decision. week. Plus, you'll gain immediate access to our exclusive members area with tons of resources you can use. Connect with Rich on Twitter at Rich Birch or through email, rich at unseminary.com. Don't forget to check out the show notes for this episode at unseminary.com. It includes links to what we talked about today and more. Leave a comment. We'd love to hear from you. Did you enjoy today's episode? Drop by iTunes and leave a review. Thanks again for tuning in to this week's Unseminary podcast. Join us next week when we'll learn more stuff we wish they taught in seminary.